the Council of Nicaea that we talked about in the last episode, it dealt with more than just the Arian controversy over how to understand the nature of Christ. The little over 300 bishops who gathered in Nicaea also issued a raft of rulings on issues of church life that had been subjects of discussion for years. Chief among these was settling the date for the annual celebration of the resurrection of Christ. They also set various rules for organizing the church and the ministry of deacons, elders, and the now emerging role of priests. As the church grew with more congregations being formed, the need for organization became apparent. For purely administrative reasons, the church world was divided into provinces with centers at Rome in the west and in the east, four headquarters. Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople. Now, it may seem odd that only one church was the western center, while the east had four. Why so many? The answer is that it was in the east that the church had its greatest extent and growth. The bishops at these five churches were given oversight of their surrounding regions, and this stoked a major rivalry. Not between Rome and Constantinople, as we might expect, and will take place later, no, there was a bitter rivalry between Alexandria and Antioch, the empire's second and third largest cities after Rome. These two cities vied with each other for leadership of the entire East. That rivalry became complex when the church at Constantinople, which was the new capital of the empire in the East, was added to the mix. The contest between Antioch and Alexandria at first took place mostly in the realm of theological debate, but later became sinister when ecclesiastical position equaled power and wealth. While the amazing unanimity of the bishops at the Council of Nicaea seemed to presage the dawn of an era of peace and tranquility for the church and the empire, it was not to be. Though the bishops agreed on the Greek word homoousius to describe Jesus as being the same substance with the Father, Many bishops left Nicaea feeling that the Emperor Constantine's pressure had coerced them into taking a position they weren't completely happy with. So after Nicaea, they regretted knuckling under to the Emperor's haste and grew resentful of his urging a conclusion. Now, I want to avoid getting technical, but that's precisely what all of this was about. A highly technical issue of the parsing of words, trying to find an accurate expression of both their belief in the humanity and the deity of Christ. It isn't that the bishops didn't believe that Jesus was anything less than God, it's just that the word used in the Nicene Creed, homoousius, didn't quite capture what they thought the truth of Jesus' deity was. Many of the bishops were uncomfortable with that word because the Gnostics had used it to describe their beliefs about Jesus a few decades before. Not long after the Nicene Council, many of those who'd signed the creed backed away from it. Alternate creeds were offered, some close to the Nicene version, and others a great distance from it. But none repeated that word homoousius. It was in the East that the greatest theological turmoil ensued. After Constantine, several emperors were decidedly hostile to the Nicene position. A few were openly friendly with the Arianism that Nicaea was supposed to have buried. As we've seen in recent episodes, although Alexandria was a lead church in the East, its bishop Athanasius was the sole standard bearer for the Nicene Creed in the East. Although Constantine had sponsored and endorsed Nicaea and enforced its terms, his desire to bring unity to the empire and church moved him to press bishops to reinstall Arius and his followers, not as leaders, but simply as church members. When Athanasius and other Nicene-keeping bishops refused, Constantine punished them with banishment. And after a season, he might well, change his mind and allow them to return. But when those same church leaders again proved too principled for his taste and some other ruling that he wanted adopted, he would banish them once again. Constantine's successors followed his lead in their treatment of recalcitrant bishops. For reasons relating more to politics than doctrinal concerns, the half-century after the Council of Nicaea saw the Eastern Church effectively taken over by Arianism. The pro-Arian bishop of Nicomedia, Eusebius, and again, not the church historian, was allowed to return to his post just after a two-year exile. He immediately set about to undo the work of the Nicaean Council. He persuaded Constantine to reverse Arius' exile, and when the heretic appeared before the emperor, he confessed a statement of faith that appeared to line up with the orthodoxy of Nicaea, but was in fact uh, just a clever piece of verbal gymnastics that fooled the emperor. Bishop Athanasius wasn't fooled and refused to affirm Arius as a member in good standing. 
So Eusebius and his supporters plotted to get rid of him. A council of Eastern bishops was called in 335 at Tyre, a decade after Nicaea. They were on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre that Constantine had just had built. At Tyre, the bishops condemned Athanasius as guilty of conduct unbecoming a bishop, which is tragically comical since Athanasius was about as pious as one could get. Remember that his heroes were the monks of the Egyptian desert, whom he'd wanted to join, but had been persuaded to take the role of the lead pastor in Alexandria. What Eusebius and his cronies meant by charging Athanasius with conduct unbecoming a bishop was that he ought to agree with them. Because, well, just because. You know, stop being so contentious, Athanasius, or we'll charge you with conduct <laughs> unbecoming of a bishop. <laughs> Athanasius recognized the ambush, and he went to the emperor to plead his cause. Eusebius followed and warned Constantine that he'd heard that Athanasius would threaten to call a strike on the Alexandrian dock workers who loaded grain into the barges that fed both Constantinople and Rome. Without Egypt's harvest, the cities would go hungry. Vicious riots would ensue. Eusebius' charge was ridiculous, but he knew the emperor couldn't risk it being true. Constantine was forced to banish Athanasius to Trier in Germania. Now, I want to pause here for a side note. As you will follow along with the review of church history, you'll see that we sometimes breeze over years, even decades of church history, with only a brief summary. Other times we slow down and we go in depth. And the reason for this is because there are moments, seasons, even eras when events occur, trends develop, movements are birthed that have a major impact on the course of the following years. Now, we've slowed down to focus on the post-Nicene years because they're illustrative of how ruinous the infiltration of politics has been on the church. Only 20 years have passed after Constantine's conversion and the Edict of Milan, and already church leaders are using their authority, not as spiritual guides to bless those that God has entrusted to their charge, but to accumulate more power and influence in the political and civil realms. A man like Athanasius, whose sole concern was to glorify God and faithfully discharge his role as a pastor, proved no match for the cunning political operator Eusebius, who used his office as bishop to bend the emperor's ear and secure civil authority to enforce his will. While the once persecuted church rejoiced that the emperor was finally one of them, they couldn't foresee that his merging of church and state would bring about a whole new set of problems that would turn their leaders into power-hungry competitors. While many bishops resisted the lure of political power and stayed true to their spiritual task, others were seduced and plunged into the great game of ecclesiastical politics, the proverbial Game of Thrones. The machinations of the contest between Eusebius and Athanasius would likely not have occurred during the persecutions of the previous decades. But when civil authority was lent to church leaders, the doctrinal daggers came out and theology became a ruse behind which to plot how to gain political advantage. Eusebius, now not the villain who attacked Athanasius, but the one who wrote the first church history chronicle, he helped blur the lines between church and state. After charting the church's course from the apostles to Constantine in his book Ecclesiastical History, Eusebius presented Constantine as much more than just a ruler kindly disposed towards the faith. Oh no. Eusebius sketched Constantine as more than that, as God's very agent, ordained by God to provide leadership for both the church and empire. Eusebius said that just as the church was a manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth, set to rule in the spiritual things, so the empire under Constantine was a manifestation of the kingdom on earth to rule in civil affairs. God would use both to accomplish his redemptive plan. And just as God ruled in heaven, Constantine ruled on earth. No, he wasn't a god, as earlier emperors had claimed, but he was, Eusebius reasoned, God's unique agent to administer his kingdom on earth. Now, these ideas of monarchy and kingship that Eusebius promoted about the emperor, well, they played well in the East, where monarchs had long been esteemed as semi-divine. But Rome's historic aversion to kings, his almost allergic reaction to monarchy, it meant that Eusebius' promotion of Constantine didn't go over in the West at all. This was another factor that added to Constantine's tendency to stay in the East. Eusebius' promotion of Constantine as the leader of both church and state has set the scene for the emergence of one man to whom the church would look for leadership. If not the emperor, then another dynamic church leader, a bishop of bishops. 
When Constantine died in 337, the empire was split between his three sons, who each lined up behind a pro or anti Nicene stance. Eventually, one of them, the pro Arian Constantius, asserted sole authority. But immediately after Constantine's death, many church leaders were allowed to return to their homes from exile, including Athanasius. His enemy, the pro Arian Eusebius, moved from Nicomedia to the capital at Constantinople where he convinced Constantius to once more banish him. Athanasius knew that Eusebius was moved by sheer political will and went, watch this now, to Rome to plead his case, not Constantinople. Now, in 340, a council of Western bishops was convened that reversed Athanasius' excommunication and reaffirmed the doctrinal position of the Nicene Creed. This was a gauntlet hurled to the ground before the Eastern churches, who were by now leaning decidedly towards Arianism. They counted the emperor as a chief defender and advocate. The Eastern bishops asked a crucial question, one that becomes central in the decades that will follow. It was this, what gave Rome the right to overrule their decisions? After all, Athanasius was Bishop of Alexandria, an Eastern city. He was their problem, not Rome's. So how did the West think that it could meddle in Eastern affairs? And besides, do you guys in Rome really want to mess with the emperor? He is, after all, our guy. The following year, 341, the Eastern bishops called their own council in Antioch to counter Rome's. Interestingly, when they sat down to establish an official position on Arianism, they realized that it couldn't be supported, <laughs> and they instead repudiated it. Discussions revealed that they weren't pro-Arian so much as uncomfortable with the way that the deity of Christ had been put at Nicaea. It's like the members of a family each thinking, fish, I haven't had fish for a while, I should have some fish. But then when they all talk about where they want to go for dinner on Saturday night, they all agree what they really want is prime rib. Eusebius was clearly pro-Arian, and he had the emperor's ear, but when the other Eastern bishops gathered, they realized they didn't really want his fishy Arianism. What they wanted was the prime rib that the Nicene Creed had sought to serve up, but ended up kind of dishing ground beef. So the 341 Council of Antioch repudiated Arianism. But they were going to have none of Rome's meddling in their affairs and refused to reverse Athanasius' exile. Ultimately, the Council of Antioch failed in that they were unable to offer a creedal statement that improved or fixed the problems that they had with the Nicene Creed. Their efforts ended up only adding to the confusion on what Christians believed about Jesus. Now, at the promoting of his brother Constans, Constantius called for a council of both Eastern and Western bishops at Sardica in modern Bulgaria just a year after the Council of Antioch. This council accomplished nothing but to further divide East and West. Though a temporary calm ensued, the fracture between the two halves of the empire revealed at Sardica only became more pronounced in the decades that followed. And it was never healed. Athanasius returned to Alexandria yet again, only to be banished a few years later, when Constantius took control of the Western Empire from his brother. Constantius then allowed his Arian friends to dictate policy in the West, as they'd been doing in the East. Nicene bishops were replaced by Arians. Athanasius was again condemned and banished. Wow, you know, you have to feel for this poor guy who just wanted to take care of his flock, but could not sit idly by and watch corrupt men make war on the truth for political gain. As Constantius' reign entered its last years, he forced a couple more councils to adopt the Arian-backed word homoousius to describe Jesus as being of a similar substance with the Father rather than the Nicene formulation of homoousius, one and the same substance as the Father. And again, as at Nicaea, this terminology was rammed down the bishop's throats. As happened after Nicaea, they went away from the council resentful of being pressed to accept a doctrine they couldn't support. The effect was the exact opposite of what Constantius and Eusebius wanted. The bishops retreated to the Nicene Creed. Homoousius might not be precisely how they would describe Jesus' as deity, but it was better than the newly required homoousius and would have to suffice until someone could come up with a better way to state it. That better formulation of the deity of Christ came from the three bishops who took up the Nicene standard after Athanasius died. And we'll take a look at them next. But I want to end this episode with a comment about comments. This video series on church history 
is a follow-on to an audio po podcast that I did some years ago. In that original series, I attempted to keep it nonpartisan, but would set off personal commentary with a kind of verbal parenthes parenthesis so that listeners would know when I had moved from reporting history to opinion. And I got a great email from a subscriber who told me that he'd recommended the podcast to many of his friends and acquaintances, and a few told him that they enjoyed the podcast until <laughs> my particular bias came out. Then I guess they stopped listening. And he was bummed because he liked the podcast and put up with my personal commentary because he mostly agreed with it, but also because the rest of the podcast steered an unbiased course through the subject matter. So we, he and I shared a, a short back and forth email dialogue where I shared why I do make occasional comments. I realized while writing him that I ought to share that with listeners. He thought it was a good idea, and so I did. And I want to repeat that here as well. Alongside the presentation of church history, I make personal remarks and commentary for two reasons. First, well, if I can say, you get to know me a little better. With my favorite podcasts and videocasts, after a while, I find myself wanting to know more about the author. So when they share little tidbits about themselves, it's fun. It makes the whole experience more relational. I don't want to hear a whole podcast about their, I guess, cat or something like that, but hearing that they, you know, have a pet <laughs> makes the experience more personal. And second, far more importantly, really, I think it's good for us to hear the opinions of those that we differ with in their own voice, rather than just being told what they believe by those of our own persuasion. The followers of Jesus ought to be aimed at relational maturity, and that means accepting that there's a big world out there filled with people who don't all agree with us. Learning to respect them and let them speak without feeling like we've betrayed some kind of loyalty to God is crucial. I can listen without agreeing. In fact, I need to, because oftentimes by listening, I realize what others have told me someone believes they don't. And even if they do, persuading them isn't going to be furthered by shutting them off and turning away because I don't agree. Now, I, I want to elaborate on that a bit because it seems that we now live at a time when polite, respectful debate has degenerated into vitriolic name-calling and a disdainful denial of the other side's right to even exist. This is true on both sides of the political and theological spectrum, but to me at least, it seems driven largely by what's taking place right now in the political realm. Habits learned there have spilled over into the church and among the followers of Jesus. Social media is largely to blame. There's been a slow degradation in old-school print and broadcast media from a generally moderate position to, at first, alternate niche publications espousing fringe ideas to some of the mainstream media outlets bringing niche interests indoors in special sections. Those niches eventually grew to engulf their entire host. Ideological camps formed with the public lining up within them. With the advent of the internet and social media, people no longer look to others to voice their opinions. They could do it themselves through you know, Twitter, now X, f Facebook, no longer needing to actually speak to someone face to face, you know, to look into their eyes and listen to their own voice. It became easier to hurl flaming bolts of ire back and forth. An insult became an art form. Alienation and anger grew apace with self-righteousness because with every insult leveled at a tweet or post was another voice giving support. A kind of tribalism has taken over, and all the tribes are at war. To be a diplomat is to be called disloyal to the tribe. If you aren't all in for your side, your allegiance is suspect. And being all in means repeating the lines and the slogans, the insults applied to the other side. If you're willing to even talk to them, you're suspect of being a closet turncoat. The day of the diplomat is past, and that's wrong deeply, horribly wrong, because it's a rejection of the example that Jesus left us. And consider this. There was no greater difference between two groups than the holy God and rebel humanity. Yet the Son became one of us, lived among us, and sought to persuade us to switch sides. Even those he knew would not be persuaded, he went after and gave them a chance to change. I submit Judas for your consideration. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, we find this, that God, quote, desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, unquote. There's a truth we must all hold dear.
It's all about relationships, and love is the bottom line. In this moment, when factionalism and division rend relationships and set people in hostile camps, the followers of Jesus must not ape the world and fall to petty bickering and tribalism. Our mission is unchanged. We are to love the lost into faith in Christ. We may not like their positions on this or that topic. In reality, we won't like them because they're contrary to God's Word. But we must not allow our disdain for the positions they hold to color our commitment to see them one to faith in Jesus as their Savior. Once He is, He can become their Lord and edit all those opinions and views that we now disagree with.